Hi, my name is Daniel Eisenberg, and I'm uh, the author of a recent book called Worthless, Impossible, and Stupid, How Contrarian Entrepreneurs Create and Capture Extraordinary Value. That's the book jacket right there. It's been covered by The Economist, The Financial Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, and Forbes, and so on. And uh, the fundamental thesis of the book is that to be really successful entrepreneurs at the early stages have to be doing things that everyone else, or almost everyone else, considers to be worthless, impossible, and stupid. They feel like the, the people think they're crazy at the beginning. And there are several chapters in the book, about 25 entrepreneurs from all over the world are profiled. One of the chapters is on a company called Local Motors and an entrepreneur named Jay Rogers. And so we're inaugurating our series of Hangout videos uh, by spending 15 minutes with Jay Rogers. Jay, are you there? Dan, it's, it's, I am great, great to be here, and thanks for having me. Great. So, Jay, just in a, in a few words or sentences, tell us what Local Motors is, and then we'll go back to the beginning and talk a little bit about how you got here. Local Motors is a world of vehicle innovations. We are a company that's using co-creation with a global community, and we are using micro-manufacturing to make the things that come out of that co-creation effort all in the vehicle world. And so we basically are, in short, a new kind of car company that is changing the way that you design, build, and sell vehicle innovations. So... Uh the automotive industry is is not one, you're broader than automotive, but let's just focus on cars for a second because I think you've been selling those a little bit longer than your newer products. Um, in, in an automotive in, uh, uh, manufacturer is not what a lot of people would, be, would consider to be an attractive business these days. Uh, why do you think it's attractive? Well, I think it's attractive because of precisely the reason that the global world doesn't see it as that. There's an opportunity there where if everyone saw it, it would already be done by everybody. And there is there are many difficulties in the automotive world that are hard to get over. And it's those difficulties that make it a good industry. If you have the business model and the people and the skills to get over those difficulties, then there is a huge amount of opportunity because it's precisely because of those barriers that the industry has not evolved in a way where uh, the products are keeping pace with consumer demand. So how, you, you used the word micromanufacturing a few times, and micro sounds obviously small, but you're building something <coughs> big. How do you get from something micro and local to something big and global? In a, in a phrase, you know, we've learned from Henry Ford the word economy of scale or the phrase economy of scale, which simply denotes big capital investment spread out over large number of units, and that gets you an economy. And this is, in a sense, in a phrase, an economy of scope, which basically means that you are figuring out a low-cost way to deliver small volumes of product in many different locations and being able to charge profit for each of those products because they're tailored for the location. That's what an economy of scope brings, and that's what Local Motors is doing in the vehicle industry globally. So I'll tell all the viewers to check out their, their website, uh, local-motors.com, and you'll see they, they're amazing videographers, uh, if, if nothing else. Uh, and you'll see the Rally Fighter, which is an amazing car, and it's gotten uh, global attention. You'll see some of the combat support vehicles. You'll see skateboards, electric bicycles, motorcycles, and all kinds of vehicles that actually, in just five years, are rolling off these, the, these micro-assembly lines that, that you have, Jay. It's really amazing. Where do you have your manufacturing locations now? So our micro factories started in Phoenix. Our next one is open in Las Vegas. The third one's going to open in Knoxville, Tennessee in just about a couple of months, two months. And then we're looking to do a European expansion this summer and in the Middle East later on in the year. And uh, you will see in the next 10 years, 100 micro factories open all over the world. This is very different from Tesla Motors, which is in the headlines these days. And almost every day it's in the headlines for one thing or another. And you started, I don't know, about the same time. Maybe you were a little bit later. But talk about the different approaches, the different uh, amounts of capital that you've needed. In a soundbite, <clears throat> Tesla Motors was a new car company built in an old way. 
So, I mean, that may be offensive to the people in Tesla Motors, but it's meant not to denigrate in how great of a job they've done in building a business to build an electric car. But really, that was a very large capital play. They raised so far about a billion and a half dollars, if not more, in equity in order to be able to make a line of vehicles, two to be precise, first the Roadster and then the Model S, to do it out of a big factory, if you will, and then have it distributed by regional dealerships. And that's a very old school way to make cars. That is an economy of scale. Local Motors has raised about $15 million of capital. 100, 100. And yes. by the way, I'm one of those very small investors in Local Motors, just as disclosure. That is a good disclosure. So the idea here, instead of having retail outlets that are around the world, which deal with all kinds of regulatory issues about import and uh, content that's not made in the country, and fighting all those same old fights, unionization at the factories, other things like that, Local Motors is focused on small capital investments in multiple micro factories to make vehicles that are regionally relevant and to provide jobs and to provide technology that is regionally relevant, and it makes it a very different growth model for the business. Tesla raised a billion and a half dollars. Local Motors has raised 15 million dollars so far and we have three micro factories going up on that capital alone. The, um, and, and how many jobs have you created roughly? We've created about a hundred jobs so far and that's direct jobs. The, of course the multiplier in the industry we think right now is about 16 so we think that we're working somewhere around 1600 jobs. Okay, so uh, policymakers everywhere today, these are, these are things that they like to hear, but let's go back to the beginning when you were starting conceiving of this idea and also getting the resources together to make this work or to prove that it can work. What was that like, Jay? I know it wasn't easy. Well, I mean, that really is something where Tesla Motors and Local Motors share a lot in common. It is hard in America, especially today, to raise money for a manufacturing company. We're done with that. We're over that. We are service investors. We're bank investors. We're internet investors. We are maybe biotechnology investors. Manufacturing, we don't do that anymore. That's what happens in China or in Bangladesh the sort of dirty jobs that we give to other people. And for those that are really in the manufacturing trade, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the GMs, the GEs, they understand that new products don't happen unless you manufacture and you are in the know about how to make things. It's that simple. So I think for us, raising money was very hard because we couldn't tap the capital markets like the traditional manufacturers could where we could issue a debt uh, offering and then raise money that way. We had to go for equity capital and we were facing a tidal wave of doubt. I mean, go to Silicon Valley, it was almost silicon nothing for us because you say the word manufacturing, forget even co-creation or global or an internet of things, it didn't matter. When you mentioned the word cars, it was terrible and there were about seven other car companies that tried to start in at the same time, the Coda Automotives and the V Vehicles and the Next Auto Works and the um, Apteras and the Fiskers and all of them also raising money or trying to and then all of them now having gone out of business um, really hurt any effort we had to raise money. It was near to impossible as we started and that made it a big challenge. And how about the other resources that you had to get together? Some of it was capital and some of it was payment in kind, some of it of course so that's, social so support and other things. Talk about the other kinds of resources. Here we are seven years later with uh, um, you know a hundred employees and three micro factories and products going out the door so we did it and the way we did it was interesting. Uh, we, we learned quickly that the money wasn't going to come from your traditional venture fund. Uh, it wasn't a good match to be charitable and uh, so we said okay we're going to have to go tap other people and I went to the angel community which people were sort of lionizing at the time and I had an offer. My first offer was you can have a million dollars to start the what you first need for local motors and I said this is great until they said we want 90 percent of your company. I said wait a second I'm building a manufacturing enterprise that's going to span the world. We are going to need more capital than a million and if I sell 90 percent of the company for a million bucks today there's nothing left to build a company afterwards. And he was a very smart investor, turns out to be one of my largest investors today, and he said, you know what, I need that risk payback, I need that payback for my risk because I know very little about this industry. But if you can find someone 
who will give you a different valuation, then I'll be happy to invest that same million dollars alongside them with one caveat. They have to know a lot about the industry. So I set out to find that person, and I did find it. I found it in a small company that basically said, we have everything you need at the beginning. We've got people, we've got tools, we've got space, we've got internet, we've got all the things you need, suppliers. So we would like to give you those things to get started, and if we value those early on, what would you think that would be worth? And we were able to come to a valuation where we felt that payment in kind was actually the kind of value that I could take, and then I worked for a couple of years to build the value of the business, and then I went back to that investor and said, now I'd like your million dollars at the better value for you and for me. And, uh, and that's how we leave it ourselves into our first investment. It's a story that we came to as the necessity is the mother of invention, and it made sense. And I think the lesson there is when you're in an industry where capital isn't going to flow clearly to you, which is sort of the basis of entrepreneurship, it's a contrarian game, and the great advantages often don't have the great capital. My father and grandfather used to say, bankers are the worst. They want to give you money when you don't need it, and they don't want to give you money when you do need it. And venture bankers are really no different than that. And so I think that if you're in wide open area where there's great opportunity, you got to find a way to get the capital. And for us, it was payment in kind before payment in cash. And that was Factory 5 it was Factory called? Factory 5. So the, the brothers, the owners at the that time. Was a real angel. That's a real angel. They were a real angel and uh, boy I, I can say nothing but great things about their faith in local motors at the time. And Jay, just going back again to the beginning, what were some of the w most striking things that people said uh, or, th or the things that people thought but didn't say about what you were trying to do when you were, I want to remind everyone, 2008 was when GM was on the verge of bankruptcy and Toyota announced its first losses in its history. So this was not a good time for the automotive industry, to put it mildly. What do you think people were thinking that they weren't telling you? What did they even say to your face at the time? I mean, there are so many epithets. The wall of failure sort of goes up behind me, you know, in history and of the number of people that wrote, you know, good on you, young man, which was translated in, you'll never succeed. This is a terrible idea. And, uh, of, and then other people who were sort of blindly optimistic were saying, it's great, it needs to happen, and you should go after it. And I think the thing that I would say about both of those types of advice is they typify what an entrepreneur has to deal with. The people who are saying this is a terrible idea, they're the ones where you need to show them strong optimism and confidence around the idea and in the face of their withering criticism, you have to say, let me take that and show you where your uh, assumptions are wrong. But unfortunately, for the people that show you blind optimism, you have to do the opposite. You have to look at their blind optimism and say, there are risks. And here are the things that I'm trying to mitigate as you go. And, and, and it was sort of, so I can't even say that everyone said it was a bad idea. The craziest thing is many people said it was terrible. But the craziest thing is that you can't fall in love with either of the parties that are giving you um, feedback. The optimistic ones need the pessimism or the criticism. And the pessimistic ones need the optimism. And, and that really typified the early days. Jay, say a word about the, the more psychological, social support that, uh, that you were getting from your loved ones. I know you have a, a very young, you're building a family at the same time you're building a company. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, your friends and so on, what, what were some of their reactions? The, the bottom line is uh, I, you need a very robust social network to start a company, especially one that's disruptive and needs years to develop. And uh, you know, my co-founder, he decided it wasn't right for him, and he dropped out of the project before we even incorporated. And so losing his support, his moral support and his intelligence was very hard for me. And I relied a lot on my advisory network, which were friends. They were more than business partners, and I relied entirely on my family and my wife to be able to um, have the strength to say, this will work. There are many scary things, but it couldn't be worse than being shot at in the Marine Corps where I was seven years, for seven years prior to joining. And so if you keep your touchstone um, and you let your friends help you, uh, I think that is the only way to stay grounded throughout this process. And I had two kids at the time. I now have four, all boys. And uh, they have been through this crazy journey with me and when I come home at night, a great man, uh, Steve Belkin, who started a, a business in Boston, who spoke to us in 
our early days um, at getting going at Harvard Business School, he said, for those of you that are entrepreneurs out there, you will lose your center at some point. And the only thing that I can say is get it back in line at quickly. And, and he said, the only way you're going to do that is by coming home to your family every day and telling them what happened during the day. Even if you don't want to replay it, if they don't hear, 10 days down the way, they'll never be able to catch up. And you'll be angry about something that they'll never see or happy about something that they can't take part in, and you, you lose your center. So I've had a great backing from my family and my friends, and, and they've allowed me to keep the, my center because I share with them what I've gone through. I, I want to remind that everybody that this is Jay Rogers, the CEO and founder of Local Motors. That's local-motors.com. We've got some very, very interesting things to view on their website. And I'm Dan Eisenberg, the author of Worthless, Impossible, and Stupid, which chronicles just – this is just one of the stories. And, Jay, you know, I, I just am struck so – so strongly by the contrast between the popular image of entrepreneurship these days and you have a WhatsApp being sold with 500 or 600 people for $19 billion and it seemed to happen overnight and of course it wasn't easy. I'm sure if I went back and interviewed from and Brad, his, his co-founder, they would say also that no one thought we were doing something worth doing at the beginning either. But I'm so struck by the fact that this is you're talking about real company building. This is not a flesh in the pan. This is something that one devotes one's life to, builds. And you know, I'll, I'll end with this, Jay. Uh, I don't think I've ever told you this, but one of my the students, Jay was one of my students at the Harvard Business School the year before Jay was my student. One of them asked me for my final lecture. One of the questions I want you to address is, what is, what is beauty? And he was being facetious and a little bit snippy. But... I thought about it, and then I actually answered this question. And for me, beauty is seeing a company like a local motors 10 years or 15 years later with factories in different countries, profits coming in, the uh, of course, thousands of jobs being created, wealth being created for shareholders, pride and satisfaction, the innovation. For me, that's what beauty is, is beauty is looking back and saying, you know, realizing it wasn't as easy as I could make it seem now, but it was really worthwhile, and I can see the fruits of my labors. So, um, Jay, I want to thank you so much. You and I have been friends for a while. I look forward to tracking your progress uh, as you go forward, and I'm sure it will be a great future. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.